soul. You need to gavel. Yeah, gavel. Okay, welcome all to the January <laughs> meeting. Uh, I've uh, had a New Year's resolution. I'm going to actually run the meetings better than I have. <laughs> so I brought my my memory uh, board here. It's a legal pad. So I have an uh, agenda, and we've got a fair amount of stuff to do, so I best get started. Uh, anyway, uh, we normally start off with introductions. I am uh, Clark Hecker, the president of Club K3NI, and my home group PA is Lucita, just south of Redstone, Colorado. John W. Hardy, King, Rifle. Uh, KD0YDH, Batty, Rifle. Uh, Ken, KD0HP, Rifle. Chuck, M0NHJ, Glenn. <coughs> Lucas, KD0TTP, Carbondale. Al, K0AMA, Rifle. Dennis, KD0BU, and beautiful West Glenwood Springs. <laughs> Ted, KD0UFO. Mike. <laughs> I'm Mike, K0 Carbon down map in Leavenworth, sorry. Leavenworth. Dave, KD0 WQC rifle. I'm Eric, K0 JEG, Battlement Mesa. Go ahead, Jim. AD0 Ally, Sue. Sue, N0DBY, Glenwood. Pam, KB3 UDU, Redstone. Uh, Brian, N0 THY, rifle. Uh, Bruce, WA7 EWC, Glenwood. <laughs> Jerry, M6HQ, Glenwood. Bob K9, Mike, Whiskey, Mike, Glenwood. Kevin, K0, Glenwood. Okay, the first thing I want to discuss is uh, I really want to thank Eric for the great job that he did as program chairman. Through the summer, we had some really good uh, presentations. He did it right. You know, he organized it, he asked for input, and all of that. Uh, it was a really good start. I was impressed. Thank you very much. And then you found a girlfriend. Oh, oh, yeah. Part of it. Part That's of it. a big complete. Uh, yeah. yeah. Rumor has it Ms. Lovelock got involved and, and uh, that just slowed things down a little bit. So he's asked me to, to find a replacement and I need one. In the interim, of course, as usual, I fall back on the the uh, old favorites, Bob and Ken in this case, and, and uh, we're carrying on with the uh, program. So we, I think we've got one lined up for uh, February, but we need it for March and on. Well, not Eric is going to do Eric it. has already volunteered for a battery kind of thing. So number one, we're looking for a program chairman. So if you have any inclination to do it, please do it. It's a great way to get active in the club and you know, show your capabilities and move yourself on up if you want to be president or vice president. <laughs> probably be one of those too in a uh, not too distant future. <clears throat> okay, uh, the other thing uh, <laughs> comes to my attention that uh, we should have had election like today. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. this, came, this came to your attention <laughs> after you resolved to do a better job of running the meeting. He realized that after. Clark. For the presidency. All in favor? Aye. Uh, <laughs> okay, the elections are over. Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> so do I, I re yeah, treasure the Yeah, Absolutely. Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. This is, this, this, this is faster than I could want <laughs> I was really thinking we'd do it in May, but hell, <laughs> just get it done. Okay, uh, so elections are done. <laughs> now, I, I ambushed uh, Kevin because we haven't had a treasurer's report. Uh, so I ambushed him this morning and he asked if he couldn't give us an estimate of where we are. And he agreed. So, up uh, uh, top of my head, we're a little over $11,000. We've uh, got a second tenant in the building on somebody again, so our cash flow is improving like it used to be. So, we're fine. When did the dividend checks come out? Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the insurance policy. Uh, are there any other announcements other than? I've got an announcement. Uh, <clears throat> those of you who go regularly to breakfast uh, know our normal uh, uh, server there is Corel, and Trish gave her a 
Christmas present this year, and we didn't get time to put it in before uh, Christmas there. So I'm going to pass this around. Anybody who's at breakfast goes to breakfast and wants to put a few bucks in the thing here for Corel to make up for Trisha's. Thank you. Trisha's uh, input there. Uh, please just put put your money in. I'll pass this around. Go this way first, I guess. And anybody who wants to put something in there, uh, it's appreciated because Trisha went, went ahead and did it without getting Yes. Anyway, so thank you. Anybody who wants to put something in there? Well, uh, just outside the door, there's uh, five pieces of cable that are starting to be put on their RGA style. They put a dozen different, a couple different uh, pipes that are in there. So grab what you want. What doesn't go when I leave is going out to the uh, scrap dealer. Why did you bring that up a couple of months ago? <laughs> I didn't get that far in the pile. Oh, <laughs> so I ordered mine through HRO, so I got a whole bunch of mine. Yeah, there's stuff in the back over there on a, a bench, and oh. actually the stuff that's on display today is also up for grabs. And I uh, highly recommend if you're a uh, general or above uh, and you want to get into HF, uh, some of these old rigs will service your needs quite well. Uh, I've got nothing but really good comments about the side fan. <laughs> The way, they, the way it sounds, these are two driven uh, rigs, uh, the outputs, uh, and they're, they're pretty scary. Uh, which brings me to the topic, not any more announcements or anything else anybody wants to make. The topic for this month is old time with HF radio. An old time operator to go with them. <laughs> I, I, I had a, 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 a selfish reason for promoting this idea. I had three of these 520s lying around, and I've had it for a year or more. I didn't even get the course of this. You know, I didn't in life, a couple years ago, I think, you know, and we had 18 people that passed the exam uh, or technician, if I'm not mistaken, and nobody has upgraded in that group to no, we did have. We had some. We yeah, had, we had at least two. At least two. Okay. Next year. We, we had a, a, an Elmer program that we were trying to promote at the time. Uh, and these rigs were made available. And of course, since then, I've got two uh, HF rigs the uh, TDS, that's not right. it's <coughs> FTDS 5000, which is the, I guess the days of the ICOM 73. So I'm, I'm, I'm well radioed up in that area. Uh, in fact, because I only know and understand how to use half of what's uh, available in those two boxes. But uh, yeah, with Ken Self, we were over here, we did a digital. Uh, finally got me on uh, pizza on here, so I can just say digital <laughs> radio. Yeah, perfect audio. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing about it, you know, well, you know, why rave about those rigs? We're really talking about the old ones, but they're worth raving about. That's about really the final comment on that. Uh, okay, so I had the three rigs, and uh, you have to understand, these things uh, came about, I bought my first one, which is right here, uh, in 76, and before that, we were doing here, but it was a bit. I was in the Glasgow Site Radio Club, uh, WB3BNR, was my uh, ball sign as a novice, do not necessitate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, at any rate, uh, now I got a field day and we all ran CW. There wasn't anybody that really did sideband. Sideband rigs were exotic, you know, they had electronics in there. And, Got rid of the other side man, the carrier. That was a lot, way too much. We were just trying to get a single out. So I had a, 
a uh, VFO and a, a, a transmitter and amplifier, and then I had a, a military used uh, ANSRR 13A, which is a Navy HF receiver. It was used to teletype and uh, we do AM and CW. Sideband, well, if you use the BFO function on 75 meter phone band, you can actually hear what was going on. And so I had bought a, a sideband exciter kit and never finished it and sold it. And then I got my advance and I bought this guy. And I paid $600 and some odd dollars for it. Just, just love it. Uh, so I thought maybe we'd talk about the rig that got away. <laughs> When I made the announcement for this program, uh, I had three rigs. And one I had been using right up until uh, last summer uh, was a 520SE. And Al knows the history on it. And I thought I'd ask him to comment on it. Because at one time I had belonged to Pat, KD0K, who's not here. He's been in Florida right now. But he's so delighted to get his rig back. So It was, in fact. I, uh, I met Pat, Pat, I guess, back in the very early 70s, and uh, I was just getting into ham radio, and I met Larry and Bob and Sue at, in the beginning, and I, did, I, I didn't own a radio yet, but I wanted one. I, I had, the first thing I had was an Icon 2A, you know, everybody had an Icon, without the touch and uh, so anyway, I eventually got my novice ticket and uh, started with a lousy radio called the Swan. Uh, I saw an ad in the paper for uh, one of these newer uh, transceivers, and it was a fellow in silks. And I, I called him up and drove down the silks. He was in that subdivision just south of the highway there. He wasn't a ham, and he didn't know much about the radio. He had gotten it from someone in London, and that's all he could tell me. But on the box, was, it was in the original shipping box, was Pat's name, the call sign, which I recognized. Well, I bought the radio and used it for about a year, and bumped into Pat at one point and told him I had it. He said, oh, that radio went with a doctor friend of mine down to, where was it? Well, Saipan. Saipan. Wherever the heck that is. He had a friend who was a missionary doctor, and... Yeah, wherever the heck that is, yeah. And took it traveling with him after Pat had traveled quite a lot with him. And uh, at the time, I told Pat that I had it. He didn't seem very interested. And then uh, I met Clark in Redstone when he first moved there. And he had a rig at home. And I didn't know if he had a functioning rig or his I had, the, I had the HW100, the heat kit. Yeah, and you're using it, right? Yeah, yeah. It was horrible. <laughs> 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 well, it warms the room. Oh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I had by that time I purchased a TS-130, which to me was a huge leap forward. That was an incredible rate. And uh, I gave the one I had. You gave it to me. To Clark, so that he'd have a radio to use at his redstone location, because the other radio didn't seem great. And he had it in storage for some time. And then when this program came up to reintroduce them, Pat heard about it, and he called me, and he said, Al, is one of those radios happened to be the one that you called me about years ago? I said, yeah, I think it is. And he said, well, do you think I could get it back? Because he mm -hmm. just went through a big purge. I've been selling his Drake stuff for him and everything. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, this this timing comes real well because uh, now Clark's going through a purge. So I put I Clark in touch with Pat, <laughs> and they worked it out. And I think Pat went Pat, to the Pat restaurant. showed up, drove went up to, to the, the garage. Store. I had it sitting there to go in the original shipping container that went beside Pat, and it has his name on it. Yeah. You know, he looks at it and he goes, now this wasn't just a, uh, a 520. It, it had the digital readout accessory. Remote DFO, so you could do split frequency, and uh, a couple other. It's, oh, not really nice microphone and some other things. So it was a well set up rig uh, that had been used off and on uh, to great use, and then you know, 
Yeah. Well, when you have a 7300, what the heck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, at any rate, it, it, Well, he's uh, thrilled to have it back. It really is. It's great that you kept it all together in that box. Really you know, yeah, I had everything, just all that I had, you know, in our blue bin and all that. I had set it aside in a stack of five plants. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. Is that one of the uh, original shipping containers? That's yours. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> Just to show you the era. All right, well, what I was going to do here, if you'll give me permission to do it, uh, in, uh, in Sudden Storm, I wrote this section uh, that takes place underground in uh, the mountains in Vietnam. Uh, uh, in what I would say was kind of like a field day experience, 1976. Uh, and I thought I'd just read a couple of pages. I'll try to skip the stuff that doesn't uh, pertain exactly to the radio. There's two reasons why I'm doing it. One, because I want to introduce this era that these guys replaced. Uh, it's sort of a nostalgic kind of thing, oh, okay. and I need to practice in reading. I'm never going to do a author's um, reading in <laughs> February, and uh, I'm not altogether sure that I'm up to the uh, challenge without some practice. So. Anyway, so here we are. We're we're in uh, we're in Vietnam. We got uh, the hero Keith Maddox, and Tom Tran is. Uh, his uh, Vietnamese buddy of uh, mixed background. He uh, <clears throat> he's definitely on uh, his <coughs> side, but he wasn't necessarily on the side of the U.S. through the whole war. In fact, because he was working in this particular camp uh, before it was abandoned. So Keith followed uh, Ton hurriedly back into the tunnel. They're underground again. Uh, in the main passageway. Tom led the way to the radio room, which consisted of a space roughly 10 by 20 feet with a seven-foot ceiling. Around the walls of the room were benches. A strange assortment of electronics equipment was piled atop them. There were chairs arranged four-foot intervals. Possibly the equipment in front of each chair represented a specific listening station, but Keith wasn't sure. In one corner, there was even a captured R390 receiver and teletype. As Keith examined the equipment and the light provided by two bare bulbs overhead, he recognized several parts from the Japanese radio with extensive modifications. In addition, he found modified television sets and an assortment of hand wired circuits. Some were transistors and some were tubes. Whoever put this communication system together knew his electronics. Now, when I was in uh, Vietnam, we are talking to some of the uh, beach jumpers or whatever, that what they had found, they had found an assortment of stuff like this in, in Vietnam, and the teletype was running when it came into the tunnel. So there was some background on this that I, that I knew. <clears throat> what do you know about this equipment, asked Keith. I'd be mechanic, not work on radio, short Tom. Uh, there must be some HF gear here, he said to himself which uh, I should have put in in Calyx. <laughs> <laughs> Your editor Way should Way too have. late now. <laughs> yeah. Never too late. Uh, I went a little fun. Fun. When Keith was in high school, he'd had a science teacher. Get wrong with him. He encouraged him to work uh, for his ham license. A year later, after many uh, much study and some Morse code work, he got his general class license afterwards, he shopped the electronics flea markets, and managed to cobble together a station from an old World War II receiver and a used Heathkit transmitter. He spent many uh, late hours pounding on his key, communicating with other amateurs all over the world. He still had a box full of QSL cards to show for it. His experience was about to become useful. He selected a bench <clears throat> where a large Japanese AM radio sat with modifications hanging out the back. He switched on the power and donned a set of headphones. By spinning the tuning knob, the air crackled with signals. Uh, there must be a good antenna here, observed Keith, his eyes following the coax until it disappeared into the wall at the edge of uh, Phil's uh, kitchen. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there must be a. Oh, I got that. Uh, yes, I feel good too, Tom offered. And his, uh, if his guess was right, 
This was the HF receiver. That meant it operated between 3 and 30 megacycles. These frequencies were ideal for a long-range communication, kind that would take to reach Jess Less's boss uh, in Subic Bay. He guessed that the numbers on the front dial of the modified Japanese radio had some correlation with frequency. He turned tuned to 5 megacycles. Unbelievable. He heard the faintly, the relentless time signal of WWB located in Colorado, Fort Collins, right? Keith knew WWB sent time signals on 5, 10, and 15 megacycles. The military used these signals to synchronize crypto receiving equipment. How he wished he were in Colorado now instead of 50 feet below ground, high in the range, on a range in the Vietnamese jungle. Satisfied he could operate the receiver, he focused on what was probably the transmitter. In front, he found a black box with a calibrated dial on its face. Behind it were two other boxes with four dials and a single meter on each. He guessed the boxes contained a variable frequency oscillator, a low power transmitter, and a power amplifier. He tuned the receiver to 4.2 megahertz. One of the frequencies agreed. Uh, upon with Joe Scott. Joe Scott was another uh, Navy SEAL that was uh, part of the other team, left in uh, Da Nang Harbor somewhere. But anyway, uh, it took several minutes for the tubes to warm up. He t then tuned the variable frequency oscillator until he heard its harmonic in the receiver. Keith looked around for a microphone. There was none. Where's the mic? Uh, asked Keith, looking at Tom. Don shrugged his shoulders. You know C, I know C, replied Don. He spied a Morse key on the next table. He picked it up and plugged it in. He cleaned the transmitter while holding the key down and watched the meter until he had both the transmitter and amplifier tuned for maximum output. Keith was quickly getting the hang of the equipment. Don, I have to uh, tell him where we are. Do you have a map somewhere? Don disappeared for a moment and returned with a map, yellowed with age. It's all in French, said Keith. Pardon, monsieur, uh, we once were French, you forget? Keith took a moment to draft a message, and I, I won't go into how he did all of that, but they had, uh, you know, the, I list the contents of the message and, and the code that they used, and, and, and the conversion part to it. But with all that done, he starts out, Keith took hold of the Morse key, his fingers felt cramped and damp. He hadn't keyed for years. But he still remembered the code. He put the transmitter on full power and keyed down. The large tubes in the amplifier immediately went blue. That, by the way, is a mercury vapor on a diode. And I had a Gonson that just lit the room up with this really beautiful blue light. <laughs> and the shame of it was that when I lost one of them, you could go to Radio Shack and for a dollar or so buy a thousand volt EIG diodes, replace it, and all. They worked just fine, but the blue light was gone. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Their massive plates began to glow slightly red. The lights in the room dimmed noticeably. I love that. Uh, there was a definite smell of ozone in the air. Keith released the key and began a series of beams. Da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. Then he sent the code words, Father, this is son, and waited for a response. There was none. Only the background racket from distant lightning. Fighting panic, Keith waited. Slowly he tried again to send the code words. At last the receiver came alive. It was from Subic Bay. Keith copied the son as his father. Go ahead. And that's it. That's what it was like back in the day before these rigs came into uh, the So it was a lot, of, a lot of equipment and you did a lot of tuning and fussing and fiddling and you had to have a decent antenna and you still do. But, uh, it just, you know, that's part of the year. All right, and from here, I think, uh, Ken, you can, can take it and start talking about these, uh, these rigs. Thank you, Thank you Clark. I guess these are mine. So I want the next chapter, next meeting. <laughs> I haven't got the reader to you. I like that. Don't buy the book. <laughs> I've already got the book. I've already read the book. It's better when he reads it. So where's the bell bottoms and the you know, high die, big wide collar, and all that stuff? And the Dixie you should, cup hat. You're saying, Eric, that I didn't dress right for this? Well, uh, I was promised in the email 
that went out there was maybe Todd Dalbon. Uh, that you was know, Pete who didn't come. Uh, yeah, yeah, he he wouldn't show his face today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah the trouble is, I can relate to him. So, hello, everyone. Uh, fifty years ago, should think back where you were fifty years ago. Fifty years Some ago, this month, from high I was a very nervous. And I was ready to take my novice license. I was terrified. I was so scared. And so my Elmer uh, knew I was a little nervous. So anyway, I was pretty good on theory. I had studied and studied on the electronics theory for my novice test. So I was pretty much ready for that. Uh, the code, oh, back then, in those days, you had to know the Morse code. So I practiced. He had made me a cassette. Actually, that was before cassette. It was a reel-to-reel. -reel. <laughs> and that uh, had a little portable tape recorder. And he had just recorded some uh, off-the-air QSOs. I have one of those reel-to-reel -reel recorders. Yeah. You still have yeah. one now? Still and so, hey, Bob. And that's what I studied. So anyway, um, I had memorized uh, you know, the code. I knew it five words a minute. So. I thought I'd be okay, um, and then he, he decided to uh, come over and give me the test and uh, take my code down. And back then, you could have uh, uh, they were, they were, for novice tests, you could have a, 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 a more advanced hand give you the test, uh, similar to what we do with our licensing today. Anyway, so I um, he said, let's practice first. You know, I'd already passed the, the written, and so he, he said, let's practice first. And so I did. You know, he started sending the code, and I was writing it down. And uh, then he said, okay, you're done. You passed. <laughs> I said, we're practicing. He goes, no, you passed the test. <laughs> so anyway, 50 years ago, I got my novice license. And uh, six months later, uh, that summer, I got my general license. And so those were exciting times. Back then, in those days, um, most people had a separate transmitter and a separate receiver. And they were obviously tube radios. I think most of you are <laughs> enough to know what tube radios look like. Uh, and, then, uh, and then things started getting better. And in the 70s, we could buy a single box transceiver, had both the transmitter and the receiver in there. And that was pretty cool. It's kind of a big advancement. Um, and they still had two. Then, then things improved uh, towards the uh, the seventies. You could have uh, the, you could have both transistors and two, and that was a, kind of a nice thing because in the receiver, having the, the transistorized the solid state uh, made this, the the receiver it was easier to design the receiver it was, with the voltages involved, and it was smaller and lighter and all that stuff. Uh, but the transmitter part still needed the horsepower of the, of the, the vacuum tube. So that is what this radio is. It's a hybrid. It uses both tubes and solid state equipment. Okay. Uh, now, <clears throat> I don't know. I, to me, this hobby has always represented challenge. I wanted to learn something. I wanted to know why something worked. I wanted to understand this mysterious thing called a radio wave, how something could carry a person's voice or picture anywhere in the world, through the air. I just could not believe it that that could really do that. So I wanted to understand how that all worked. I'd always listened to shortwave broadcasts as a, as a little kid, and I, I got the biggest kick out of those things. So when I found out I could actually talk to those people uh, in, in foreign lands, uh, you know, I wanted that. So that's why I got my license. Uh, so anyway, that was my history. And, and these radios, the reason I bring all this up is these radios are kind of kind of been put on the shelf, so to speak, and, and, and they're great. You know, Clark kind of got me inspired because he wanted to present uh, some information about these radios because the main reason we're doing this is to find them a good home. <laughs> okay? Clark said he's not taking them home. I'm not taking them home. Uh, so we need to find a good home for these radios. <laughs> the alternative is the wrong there. And, and they're not compromised by time. I mean, they work incredibly well. It's well, not like it's a big step back. The thing is, Hale is right. 
the quality and workmanship of these radios is incredible. Uh, just lift one. Okay? Uh, they're heavy, they're very well built radios. Uh, they, and the design, some of the best audio. Perfect audio. <laughs> perfect audio. These things had perfect audio back in those days. And that was stopping. And they also worked on CW and they worked on AM. So you could, and AM really had good audio. Uh, these radios are around. Most older hams have them stashed somewhere in their house and they soon get rid of them. The hams pass away and then these radios just, where do they go? You know, so there's, there are a lot of them around if the person looks. Um, and they're usually at a good price. You can get into HF, real HF ham radio at a, at a, at a lower price than, than uh, obviously any of the newer gear that we have today. And so the price on this one really is good sell. Uh, now this radio, I didn't, I don't, maybe you don't want to hear it this far. I, I, did, uh, I did go on to QTH.com and I priced a 520 and they were all 300 and above. So even though 300 is not bad. But so here, here we're talking a good home. Okay. Um, now, some, some people are concerned about uh, EMP. You know what that is? Electromagnetic pulse. Yeah. That's a good backup for EMP. This radio <laughs> is immune to EMP. Yeah. Now, it could be lightning caused, it can be nuclear caused. Uh, but EMP will wipe out any solid state type radio equipment if that's not protected. And this radio is automatically, because of its tube system, will be, and its design is, is immune to that. Just mount it in your obsolete uh, microwave. There you go. And you are really, you're really particularly set. Uh, you know, and for me, uh, when I was a kid, you know, we had CB radio was just coming in. And CB radio was, was great, you know, it had, had a lot of purposes. But uh, after I played with it a while, it got really boring. <laughs> okay? It was the same old guys and the same chit chat and the same whatever. And it was always in somebody in town, and unless there was some wacko guy that would. You know, be on skip, but we won't talk about those guys. Like we um, 75 meters, you know? <laughs> so I thought, to me, ham radio was fun because it was challenging. I actually had to learn something. We had knobs back in those days, and and, and it was great. I, I just had to figure out what all these things did. And so, anyway, if you're going to get a tube radio, you're going to be working with knobs. Okay, so you have to get used to uh, those kinds of things. It's more of a challenge, but that to me is the fun part. And uh, I, I, uh, I really encourage you, if you like, you like learning new things and trying new things, that going back to an old HF rig can be a lot of fun. It is more work to learn. You do have to learn a procedure to use these, and we're going to be talking about that today. Um, if you're going to be in a contesting mode, uh, switching bands is probably not going to be real light and fast, you know, because of all the, the tune-up things that we have to do. Uh, these older radios have issues. Usually, uh, they need to be, there needs to be some, some restoration. And for some people, that's an, an enjoyable part of the hobby. They enjoy restoring radios and making them pristine looking like new. It does involve sometimes changing capacitors, uh, not an overly difficult thing to do. Um, and a few things like that to, to bring them up to specs. Uh, and tubes, unfortunately, don't uh, last forever. They, uh, they're kind of like a light bulb. You know, they have a filament, they get heated. They, they, uh, they put off heat. So uh, eventually they burn out and you have to replace them. So finding tubes or replacing tubes can be, can be an issue. You do have to adjust things, something called bias in order to, uh, to have it to work correctly in the circuit. And this radio, uh, very, very simple. It's just opening up a little side door and turning a little uh, knob. It's very, it's very easy. Um, the one thing that I will caution you on if you do get involved with tube type radios, is the safety of it. Uh, you know, our solid state radios that we all like to have at home now, uh, they work on 12 volts, or maybe as high as 20 or 30 or whatever, but that's about it. And I, I know we've got some engineering people here. Bruce, are you familiar with the internal voltages of oh, uh, solid state? Uh, only 12, all based on 12 volts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here we're talking voltages that could be several thousand volts. Okay. These two rigs that we have, on both 
capables in connecting to your car battery or solar system. So they work on 12. So they work on 12. Yes. 20. However, there's an inverter on the back, and the inverter changes the voltage to hundreds for the final. So by touching the wrong circuit inside there, if you opened it up with it turned on, there, there are lethal voltages involved. So as hams, we, we pride on being safety-minded. So those are the kind of things that you don't want to be doing. Uh, I think, well, we'll see about that. Anyway, we, the other couple concerns, they're heavy. Okay, they have large transformers in there because they needed transformers to, to transfer uh, energy from one stage to another and the power supply transformer that converts the 12 volts or the 110 volts uh, is very, very heavy because it has to increase the voltage considerably. So they get hot, as Jim said, you can nicely warm your room in the winter. Um, I, uh, I, I, it's always a nice, a nice comfortable warm feeling. Or create a sauna in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they're, not, they're not quite as stable. Um, they will drift as they warm up. And of course, it's no instant on. You know, how long have we had instant on in our life? You know, you flip a switch and go. Here, you flip a switch and wait. And it, the tubes have to, you know, the heater in the tubes has to warm up. And perfect for seniors. But perfect for seniors, we're not in that big a hurry. So um, the problem is that if you get on the radio too quick, the frequency will drift. So that's, that can be a little embarrassing. All right, now the other thing that we want to talk about is with, with a tube type radio, they have to be tuned. What is that? Does anybody know what means a tune? A, a, a tune radio? Calibration. <laughs> well, let's start off with solid state. Let's compare. In a solid state radio, you have, just like in this type of radio, you have multiple stages. And the stage are different circuits that provide the, the, the ability to operate the radio. For example, the first stage in most transmitters is an oscillator. Okay, if you remember your theory. Oscillators generate the RF, the radio frequency, that's going to eventually be broadcast. So that's, that's the heartbeat. Okay, now that oscillator signal is very, very weak, all right, and it has to be passed on to, a, to an amplifier. And uh, so in order to pass it to the next stage, it has to be, it has to go through a tuned circuit. And the tuned circuit has to be in resonance. And then that, that amplified signal, now it's, it's ready for the antenna, so it has to be passed to the antenna. But the antenna, uh, that's another that's like going to another stage. We have to be able to transfer that energy to the antenna, and so we have it go through another tuned circuit. There will be multiple tuned, cir tuned circuits in the radio. Um, tubes, by their, their nature, are high impedance devices. Okay, so they expect high impedance and they Unless, unless they're designed it in a certain way that they have low impedance, but almost always they have a high output impedance. Well, that doesn't work so good with a 50 ohm antenna. What, what happens if you have an, an impedance mismatch between the hundreds of ohms, thousands of ohms, to 50 ohms? What's, what's, what's that going to do? Create more heat. Create more heat, right. The tube's already got a problem with heat. They're already dealing with a lot of hot and now, now all of a sudden they're, they're expected to, uh, all this current will be going through them and uh, it'll burn them out. So, uh, so anyway, we have an SWR problem at that point as well. So we have a tuned circuit. Well, tuned circuit is simply a capacitor and a coil, an inductor. Yeah, that's all they got. And there's a really neat property. They both have reactants, which is a resistance to AC. But they happen to be completely um, opposites. So it, depending on the frequency, if you adjust the capacitor or the coil to have the same reactants as the other, they both have the same reactants, they are 90, or excuse me, 180 degrees out of phase. Well, if something's 180 degrees out of phase, what's gonna happen? Cancel, yeah. So now you have no reactants at all. The only thing that's in the circuit is simple resistance. And you can easily modify that to 50 ohms through a transform. And now you've got a perfect signal. The impedances match. The 
the energy can be efficiently transferred from the amplifier to the antenna, and we say now the radio is in resonance. What's the benefit of all this extra work? Well, very, very efficient energy transfer, and by doing that, it only passes one frequency, one, one small area of frequency, and that means all the harmonic uh, radiation uh, energy that comes from, a, from a, an oscillator in different stages is not sent to the antenna. So it automatically sends out a very, very clean signal, which was required by the FCC's FCC. So tune circuits are a good thing. Solid state devices don't need them because they are very broadband, they're low impedance, and those, because of that, you can have a whole series of you, the radio is like pre-tuned to a wide band of frequency, so we don't ever have to tune. That's what's nice. Now, what happens if you decide to go high power someday? You say 100 watts isn't good enough. I want I want my full 1500 watts yeah. allowed by law. Okay, well now you buy a linear amplifier. Most linear amplifiers require what? tuning. So even if you don't get a radio like this, you may want to get an amplifier someday. You're going to be probably tuning that amplifier because the really expensive amplifiers have solid state transistors, MOSFETs. But the, the, uh, the regular traditional amplifier that we all or that we see around still uses tubes and they have to be tuned. So that's that's why this this is kind of important for a lot of different reasons. Any, any questions so far? I'm like, I hope I have lost one. Yes, sir. Uh, he was actually, go ahead, did you want to No, no, I was just scratching my head. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I know I'm familiar with bias tuning on my guitar amplifier. And oh, okay. I, I have a couple of very powerful, <laughs> made in England, 100 watt amps. And one thing I know from my, my guitar tech is don't mess with the bias. <laughs> so what, is it, what exactly is the bias when, when they talk about that? Let's say in a tube circuit, whether it's a guitar amp or an amplifier. Well, the tube has to be, there's there's information or a signal going in on, on a grid, and I have, that gets into the technical aspect, but that that signal, that, that weak signal that goes into the tube, it's, it's controlling a very, very high voltage. Plate voltage? Plate, plate voltage. Right. Okay, it's controlling that. So small voltage, can, well, it's actually the plate current that it's controlling. And the bias adjusts how, how far negative how far positives so it's the correct class of operation. And it, it, it's, it's the two, the circuits for the tube are designed in a certain way to be very, very efficient or very, very accurate. So class A amplifier, you want the input signal to be, or the output to be exactly the same as the input. So you bias the tube so that the wave that goes in is exactly the same shape coming out. So in your music, you would want a class A. Is that, excuse me, I, I know you guys have a lot more knowledge of this theory than I'm, I will learn eventually. Is that also, is that the same as pertaining to push-pull, sir? Push-pull is, is, in, is involved in that. But a push-pull, the problem with class A is it's, it's not efficient. It takes a tremendous amount of energy and very expensive, big transformer. I mean, it's, but it's the best, I mean, far as quality. Okay, now, Ham that wants to send out Morse code, all they want to do is send out an energy burst. I don't care what the wave looks like. Okay, they just want the, the RF, the radio frequency, to be sent out. So they use class C. So it's very, very efficient, runs cooler, and sends that burst out on a regular basis. You know, no problem. You know, that that's what. So the bias adjusts where that happens. Now they cheat. A little bit, they say, Well, I want an efficient tube that'll be real accurate on the waveform. Well, what they do is they take two tubes, they bias one tube to conduct half the time, and the other tube to conduct the other half. So they're on off. And then over here, I'm, we put the two halves together. You got you got your cake and eating it too. So that's the push pull aspect. And I'm sorry about all the theory. I know, it's just enough to get myself in trouble and ask stupid questions. So. Okay. No, that's not stupid. I just, I just wanted to not skip over SWR versus tuning matching. Oh, please, please. Yeah. And, and, and because tubes, because of their nature, can 
stand a lot more SWR in solid state output transistors can. So, so you, you, if you have an SWR anything above three, and you've got a transistor output, you need to worry because it's going to can blow out your transistors. And a two, well, you probably go up to ten to one, and it's not going to hurt that too much. Well, it, when I first started in ham radio fifty years ago, I didn't even own an SWR. Uh -huh. I didn't even know what they were. Yeah. Uh, we tuned up to a light bulb. I had a DX60 and you put you plugged in a light bulb in the antenna connection and you tuned it looking at the brightness of the bulb. So what SWR does my bulb have? You know, I don't know. Uh, but we didn't worry about it. So yeah, we used to parallel generators that way back then with light bulbs. And light bulb went all the way out, you knew that you had the same voltage, you had the same voltage peaking at the same point. And the brighter the bulb got more likely you were out of phase at that point. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we got on. What the milk? Okay. Um, anyway, so now you know what resonance is. When you tune a radio to resonance, that's where you're canceling out the reactance uh, of the inductor and the capacitor, and you have to just run straight through, and uh, it works beautifully. Harmonics are reduced, uh, and you have really efficient energy transfer. So there's some real benefits to using tunes. All right, now I'd like to demonstrate the tuning uh, procedure. And what I'm really doing is I'm simply adjusting two different capacitors. Okay. These are the, these are the, I don't know if you've ever seen, I should have brought one. Anybody, did anybody bring that air, uh, air variable capacitor? Mm -hmm. There's probably some of those. Well, basically what they are, they're, they're metal fins. Yeah. And oh, they, yeah, they yeah. mesh with one yeah. another as you rotate it through them. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, there's, there's radio has several of those in there. And by tuning, by turning that variable capacitor, I adjust the amount of capacitance. The inductor is fixed. It's, there's fixed for each band. So I, that part doesn't change. And so at some frequency, that by tuning that capacitor, I completely put the radio in resonance and Ready to operate so I'm going to go through that process, and I've got to start up my uh, modern day electronics again. What are you saying? The president was long-winded? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and also keep your hands nice and warm in the winter. Oh yeah. yeah. With these cold sandwiches, you set them on top. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your tubes out. <laughs> as long as the cheese didn't drop through. <laughs> I, just, I just remember our UHF uh, transceiver equipment. Got some damn hot. It would melt the solder. And the <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. Yeah. That's generally not hard to do. Okay. If you think things are complex, look at his system here for going from an apple to. Uh, and and the cost of the connectors, I would say, probably exceeds the value of this laptop. But it's worth the floor. Where do I go? Who's that? No. Thank you. 
turn the light out. There you go. That's good. Oh, it's oh well. Goodbye. 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 All right, let's get this done. All right, now I, uh, whenever you work with tube equipment, and even I, and I would say solid state doesn't matter. Whenever you start your equipment up and you want to tune an amplifier and you want to work any of that kind of stuff, you always want to tune into a dummy load. And okay, you don't want to be putting a signal out in the air uh, while you're making adjustments and. When the radio is not in tune, it's putting out harmonic, radio, you know, harmonic uh, frequencies uh, and uh, causing all kinds of splatter and so on, different problems. Uh, you don't. You always want to keep it keep it on the dummy level. And this this little box on top here has a built-in dummy. Level, okay. So I am currently going into a dummy level, and it also tells me my forward and reflecting power. So it's like a lot. Okay. All right. Um, radio is turned on here. The switch. Bottom right corner, and I have that turned on. And uh, there are some positions that you want to put these knobs into to start with. Uh, I'm going to be working with this button here. This is called the load, and this is a, a variable capacitor. And this is the one that's adjusting the amount of load going, or the, it's loading uh, of the amplifier. And I would describe this as. You're, like when you get in your vehicle and you start it up and you have a, a manual transmission and you you uh, you have a car running, you, you step on the gas and the engine just roars. There's, there's no power being taken from the engine. As soon as you put it in gear and you let out the clutch, then you're loading the engine. Okay. Well, I have to also load the amplifier. And I have to load it the correct amount so that it matches. All right, so that's what this button does. So I'll show you that in a bit. This is called the plate. This is a variable capacitor that is being tuned so that I get the correct, um, so that I tune out the, uh, or well, let's just say I'm tuning it to resonance with this, with this knob. Okay? And this one on the, the third one, drive, just like I have to have some energy to start with. So the drive comes from the oscillator and whatever previous stages uh, are before the amplifier. And uh, so I have to have the correct amount of drive. I don't want to under or over drive the, the final amplifier. Okay, and I also have a switch over here that lets me adjust different meter positions. All right, so I start out and, um, and if I want to know the amount of current, that's as, the position it's in is as IP or in this case, plate current, the amount of current going through the tube, okay? And when I tune to resonance, I'm looking for a dip, a dip in the current, okay? Now, so as I'm tuning, I don't want, I don't want to have, uh, I don't want to, I'll be out of resonance to start with. That means the tube is going to get very, very hot. If I take too long, uh, it will destroy the tube or weaken the tube. So I have to do it very, very quickly, or as quick as I can. All right, so I have I have the transmit button over here, the switch, this little switch right here, if you can see it. Right here. Okay. Um, now, there is a position down here that allows me to put the, the radio into tune, and it really reduces the amount of voltage or in power going through this system. And so if I am out of resonance, it doesn't, destroy the tube. Now, this radio seems to have weak tubes, so um, I have to uh, I have to look, I have to have a more sensitive meter, and I have that up here in, in uh, my uh, tuner. So I'm going to flip the switch, and I'm going to be turning this plate knob and looking for resonance by a dip. Uh, you barely will see any output You'll see, if you look at that meter on top, right? Right here, just watch this little uh, thing right here. It'll just barely move. And then I'm going to turn this knob and look for a dip. Okay, right about there. Okay, at least I'm in the ballpark. I can see it. Okay, did anybody see that? Yeah. Yep, it is. It's okay. very small. Now I'm going to go to the CW position. Now I'm running full power. Okay, but I'm already partially in, in, in resonance here, so I'm, I'm ahead. 
Now I'm going to let the clutch out. And I'm going to apply, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dip again. So watch the beater up on top. Or the meter down below. You want it to be at the lowest spot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sure is. Uh, the regular some mileage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm waiting a little bit to let the tubes cool down. And I'm going to go again. There we go. Yeah. All right, boys. Well, <laughs> is it Murphy's law? If something will go wrong, it will. How can I add a little load? Demonstrate my. Go wrong, it will. Selfie. While you're doing that, is it on that radio? Is the drive setting pretty much the same for all bands? No, I <coughs> I, I skip the drive keeping section. I'm gonna go to the drive. Uh, interestingly enough, on a drive, if you're listening on an antenna, the receiver seems to be coordinated with the transmitter part. So where you hear them? Baddest amount of noise, where it's most likely going to be resonant, the drive. So, of course, there's this outlier, I guess I may have last. As you uh, were saying earlier, uh, we, we came up with all these short cuts, you know, we just, yeah. and we started transmitting. As soon as the tubes warmed up, that was the only thing you had to. One of the reasons why I asked uh, Ken to do this is because he'd read the manual and figure out how to do it right and he learns. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, I'm going to switch my meter over here to what is called ALC. That's automatic level control. And I'm going to peak the drop, which is with this part here. So I'm going to flip my switch up. Let's see if I should be in. Now, I'm turning this off until I get the biggest reading. It's a little hard for you to see this right here. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. peaking, and I'm peaking it. Yes. And I want it to at least be three quarters of the way up uh, this little uh, level right here. So I'm going to increase a little bit using adding some carrier power, which I hope not to worry about this going on All right, so this will make sure I've got the right amount of drive. Okay. Now we go back to current, and actually this can all be done in a few seconds if you do it often enough. All right, um, okay, now I'm going to check, and I'm going to go back to CW. I'm going to dip again here, see if I can get a better deal. Oh, there we go. Okay, there's my dip. And I here. Um, maybe you can see it now. Can you? All right, there's my dip. Right there. Okay. So now I'm ready to add more load. And my goal is to load it until I have 200 milliamps. And 200 would be right about there. Um, 200 milliamps. Okay? So I'm going to add some load and dip. Add some load and dip. So you have to connect and be from the so you don't overpower the system. Right. This is the editorial comment on every day of the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my memory is you get all this in four or five seconds. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Right, just, yeah. 
You just, you're That's fine. That's why Sam and Man work off the You get some presets and just preset the dials to. But the other thing, the dials out of it. The other thing a friend of mine used to do with these rings, and I don't recommend it at all, is they use a Sharpie and Mark for each band, you know. Is it the same as we No, that's the problem. Of course, that's before I started this, I, I put started. it on the band. I, I had a band switch um, that, uh, if you look over here, there's a uh, band switch down here. See where it says band? On the right? Right there. I have it on 14 megahertz. That's 20 meters. Okay. And then, uh, right here, I have that. Now, and I also set, um, I, I'm uh, currently in CW, but if I uh, want to hook a microphone to it, I can do that and I can key the transmitter. The radio is ready to be used. I just simply select the frequency oh, here it is, using the VFO. Okay. And, uh, let's see. and then after we've done it on a, on a dummy load, uh, then we switch. To the antenna. Now we have an antenna outside, uh, a little portable antenna that I made create. All I did is take a take a, a mobile antenna and uh, made a little base for it, which is just a little bag mount, and then I put radio wires on it, and it loads fine. So I'm going to switch to sideband. Let's put some. Uh, let's see if we can hear what's going on. <laughs> and you want to do this? Yeah. Nope. This is a, I expect to hear some of the noise. This is the BBC. The key to the is off in the corner. There we go. Yeah. I've got my, uh, I've got it in on uh, a USB now for my mode, upper sideband for 20 meters, and I can just wait. QRZ, QRZ is this frequency use, KV0 HD. LOCQ, LOCQ, LOCQ 20 meters, LOCQ, LOCQ. Kilo Bravo Zero, Hotel Papa, AD Zero, HP, calling CQ and standing by. All right, we'll probably stop there. And uh, unfortunately, there's not anybody there. I'd have to do it a while. So, uh, any questions? Got a comment. Yes, sir. One of the things that was uh, interesting was when Drake came out with their equipment, they always tuned the coils. They had a more expensive way to do it. Okay. And you have much less uh, interference in terms of your capacitor moving, which usually is a shield. Yeah, you can tune either one. And, and that, that was amazing because they had mechanically it was really complex because they had a screw dial screwing in the lug and a coil, and usually four at a time or three at a time sometimes. So anyway, that would be you would, and, Yeah, this is, again, similar to what you do with an antenna tuner. So if I were to use this as an antenna tuner and yeah. have to tune it, I'd still be doing the same type of thing, uh, adjusting my uh, radio <coughs> to, uh, to resonance. You know, uh, you know, all the modern built-in tuners like arm switching inductance and not the capacity. You have a whole bunch of coils in there. Yeah, but I'm saying this. Switch. I'm saying you have an external yeah. one like this. So it, it, it's gone from mostly tuning the capacitor to, to now the modern rigs are, are tuning the inductor. Right. Don't you have to tune the radio first, and then after that, go through the transmatch? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This slide is. I I just remember early on on the FTDX slide, the housing is you don't tune. In the air when you're trying to get into a net. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always wondering if it's a statue. 
Yeah, I've always wondered if it would say anything out, you know? It before <laughs> the electron, you know, before everything went transistorized. It's a way to opt. Did, uh, did anybody ever experiment with automating this? Because yeah. you know, now you push the tune button. The felt it's part. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, 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 or the tape. You know, <laughs> no, I, you know, the, they have they have automated uh, tube amplifiers. And I don't know if Phil you ever yeah. used one of those uh, from Alpha Delta. They, no. had a, they had an automatic tune uh, kilowatt amplifier. And it did still use tubes and all that, but it was all all done um, by itself. You just turn you know, the band on, the frequency. Yeah. Yeah, most, really of, most of the dials are set between zero and 100, so if you knew you wanted to be on a particular band, you'd have a chart yeah. set up with what it was for 40 meters or 20 meters. You pre tune it and get real close to yeah. the other yeah, thing. Call that guy first. I, I, I never used this method. What has been the other thing? Power maximum. Right. On the original, on the original 520, the manual tells you to not. I mean, you dip once, but the rest of the time you're just simply using the load control to maximize your output when you don't. Now there are some reasons. Depending on the depending on the, the radio, there are some reasons why you don't want to just tune to resonance at a low power, because once you change in the impedance. Right. And so you still, I think, you should still dip the very last, last thing you should do is take a final dip and make sure it's, because if you under, if you remember, anybody remember a resonant circuit? You, you know, Bruce, you know your theory pretty well, right? Okay, on a, on a, on a resonant circuit, on an LC resonant circuit, uh, let's say parallel, okay? And if you, if you are in resonance outside that circuit, it acts like it's there's infinite resistance. Okay. So uh, there's no no current going through it. Now inside is maximum amount of current because it's just going back and forth. It's like a maximum impedance. That's right. No and so by when you're when you change that power level, it ends up changing the impedance of that circuit. So that's why that, that final dip, I believe, is very necessary. On all the newer radios, they always did that. But that first that one back there is, a, is an actual 520, and I looked up the manual for that, and I was surprised to see that it did use that tune-up method that you're talking about. Yeah. So, sorry. so you yes, go sir. to your higher threshold, is what you're saying? Oh, let's see. Because if you're tuning at a lower impedance. Okay, <clears throat> on your guitar amp, and this is, this is a totally stupid analogy. <laughs> no stupid you, my question. You're, you're tuning your guitar to have a certain frequency yeah. for an A or a C or Absolutely. whatever. You know, you're doing that, right? right. Okay. Well, on a, on a ham radio, if you were to have the volume down on your amp very, very low and you tuned your guitar, mm -hmm. okay, then you crank the volume way up and you check the tune, uh, the tune would be out. And you go, well, I got to retune it again. Okay. On a, on a, if it were a ham radio, you'd have to retune it. Now, of course, on yours, once you tune it, there's also it's harmon done. harmonics in there too. Okay, yeah. so so yeah. if that the, the tuning changes when you add more. Uh, okay. I have a question for Mark, our, our resident artist. Um, <laughs> on your military radio, you were referring to earlier. In those days, because they were two driven, did they have any kind of like today? The radios, say a PRC one one seven has. NSA encryption, you can't operate it without the encryption, but that's because it's all digital. Was there any encryption then in those radios? Not in the ANSRR 13A. Uh, now, you could listen to the, you know, the crypto signals, you could hear them, but there wasn't any encryption at all. So how did you, so the signals were... Well, what we used to do, Clark, is we would transmit on a completely different band than what we were receiving on. Mm -hmm. And that's what made it real difficult for someone to listen in. So you were hopping? Well, we had two. We had a transmitter and receiver. We transmitted one receiver on another. They were, they were transmitting on a receiver, and then we'd split it that way. So somebody had to be going back and forth like mad trying to pick it up. That's kind of like a repeater. Well, sort of. The neat thing, the neat thing about that thing. particular receiver was it had a manual. Six inches thick. Yeah. And I had a problem with the IF, where the IF transformer was shorted or something. I 
one in there, and it had a description <laughs> how it, you, know, you get the right size wire and the right number of turns. I rewound a uh, IF transformer, put it in, and it worked just fine. Wow. And yeah, that was so fantastic cool. with all those military you know, miniature tubes and all of that. Yeah, and that it actually worked work on the radio like this. Yeah, yeah. 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 and you know, guys, that, that really did go to the landfill. So that's a year. Dad, you appreciate this. And the frequency hopping, you know, he discovered that and he was a patent on it. Eddie Lamar. Oh, see, I, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you read that. Piano, book. Right? That, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, you talk to these guys today that are um, deployed, you know, spec ops team guys who I've yeah. talked to recently.